Well, bonjour and hi, Montreal and Quebec. Welcome. Nice to see little, uh, more people this uh, week, and uh, I'm sure it's going to get a little bigger as we go along. So, for those of you who are not here uh, uh, regularly, this is our regular Thursday evening uh, uh, podcast, and we will start off with an acknowledgement. Okay, so with that, I acknowledge that the land where we are gathered today is the Toyetyak, Montreal, which is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kayen Kayaka Nation, the traditional inhabitants, I just have to move this this area, and are the true care caretakers of the land, with two communities bordering Montreal, Ganewage to the south, and Ganesadake to the north. The land was never ceded nor surrendered. Historically, Deyotyaka, Montreal, has been recognized as a gathering place for many First Nations. It served as a natural resting place for the First Nations travelers at the point of divergence. I honor, recognize, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we are gathered today. All right. So usually Mike finishes his segment and then I, then we, we do a segue into mine. So... Merci à tous les bénévoles. Thank you to all the volunteers. Bonjour, hi, and quoi. Um, I would like to thank everybody for all your help. Your volunteer and your time is, is greatly appreciated. The emails, the feedback, the phone calls, the organization and everything, it's not easy. And uh, I'm truly blessed that you are part of the organization helping us uh, move forward and finding out more about what the population of Quebec wants. Uh, for those that are here for the first time, my name is Mark Perez. I am the organizer of the Coalition of Independent Thinkers called Let's Talk About Quebec, Parlons du Québec. I can be reached at my email at info at parlonsdu.quebec. My phone number is 514-963-7685. You can text me, you can call me. Don't be surprised if you text me at 3 a.m. and I reply. So what is Let's Talk About Quebec? It's a Montreal-based think tank conducting comprehensive research, analyzing data, and cultivating innovative solutions to offer informed advice on diverse political, economics, and social issues. To reflect a broad spectrum of insights, we commit to consulting with experts across various fields and engaging the public through a structured voting system fostering rich dialogue and incorporating diverse perspectives. Um, this is my bio for, for that, that we've mentioned a couple of times beforehand. I'm basically a child of 101 and I'm very involved on the political scene, trying to figure out how we can make Quebec better for everyone. I'd like to thank all our thinkers for their uh, constant, co constant collaboration and, you know, taking charge of these uh, policies and providing solutions that we will be sharing with everyone uh, shortly. An update on the committee report, the healthcare committee. Unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to meet today. Uh, something came up and we had to postpone it to Tuesday. So it'll be Tuesday, June 4th, where we will be reviewing the healthcare structure with Dr. Arthur Fisher. If you want to participate, just please email me. On the fundraising committee, we have a pledge of $250 for an advertising campaign called French is Not in Danger. So that's uh, still up and running. We had the $25 donation from Ella. So thank you very much for that. The new party committee we met on uh, Tuesday, May 28th. We were uh, 11 people. And there was a great, it was a great evening, great discussions, great discovery and uh, a lot of uh, positive energy. So looking forward to, uh, to our next one. Uh, the marketing committee, we need help with, with, every, with everything that we're doing. There's a lot more work that's going on and I'm not able to keep up with all the things that we were previously doing, like 
sending out uh, emails, sending out uh, translated emails, posting on Facebook and social media and stuff like that. So if anybody wants to help, please email me, let me know. We're looking to advertise on the French network. That's the French is not in danger and the uh, Je suis Québécois. So please, if you're interested in joining, uh, please help. So uh, the next event is on June 8th, which is English is a Crime. That's the, uh, that's the rally that we're having against Bill 96. And on August 20th, we still need to fundraise the $800 to deposit to secure the event. So uh, we do need help with that. If you want to make a, a contribution to this, please feel free to reach out. On May 26, I, I did my monthly rally. I went to uh, Lego's office where I basically had a table, a chair, beautiful weather, and the Quebec flag behind me. And there were people that were passing in, in front of the table, and we were having incredible conversations. I think I had a, between 15 and 20 different conversations, and it was very positive, and, and people shared their concerns, and just like everybody else just like everybody else uh, that we've spoken to, uh, they just want to live in peace and be able to live in Quebec and be able to uh, participate in some meaningful way. The 100,000 person rally that we were supposed to have in Quebec City on June 1st was postponed because of logistics and insurance. So we're still organizing it. So if there's anybody that wants to participate, please again, feel free to reach out. And uh, I'll explain it in, in bigger details. Um, for the 8th of June, we need volunteers because we are going to be printing 10,000 flyers that we will be distributing between Friday and, and Sunday. But uh, the main event for the rally is on June 8th, starting at uh, 2 o'clock. We'll stay there for as long as people are there and the conversation is going. So if you want to come and, and be part of it, please come on June 8th at 2 o'clock on the corner of St. Catherine and Crescent. English is a crime. We had but we had a, a pledge of $250 if we were able to raise that money. So I want to thank uh, Mike, Claudia, Cynthia, and Antoinette for your contributions, which have made us me met this, this, this pledge. Uh, obviously, we, we still, if you want to donate to it, please do, because there's a lot more things that we want to do, like get placards and, and stuff like that to make the event a lot more interesting. So this is the first glimpse at the t-shirts that we will be wearing on that evening. And this is just the front. We're still working on the back to go with it. So if you'd like to order a t-shirt, send me an email and I'll take care of uh, placing the order for you and you should be able to get it by, by mail. I've already covered this. Thank you for your contribution to that event. For volunteers, please uh, send an email at info at Paranger Quebec. The cell phone is 514-963-7685. A lot of people ask us what the game plan is. Basically, uh, phase one was the, the court challenge of Bill 96 plus the injunction. So that's already being taken care of. So we decided to move forward with the think tank. The next phase is the political party, which had already has already started on Tuesday. And then phase four is winning the election and bringing peace to Quebec. Sound strategy. A lot of people want to know how they can help us. Very easy. Like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, join us on LinkedIn, follow us on YouTube and leave a Google review on our, on our, on our business page. The importance of that is that being on those social media, you can come on board and you could reshare the content, which is very important. And that's how visibility grows. And by joining the Facebook page, you can invite your friends that have similar interests as you so that we can continue to grow um, the organization. So before I get to Rahul, Mike, are you here? Oh, you can't. You're unmuted. I'm here. Okay, you're here. Do you wanna you wanna try before I get into Rahul's presentation? Yep, I'll just try it really quick. Okay, so okay. so go ahead. I gotta go and get this bigger. Gotta go into here. Okay. 
And um, yeah, go into presentation mode. And there what you go. did the last time was that, but you went duplicate. Don't go duplicate. Go to no, I was yeah. going. See, I didn't go duplicate. I didn't. Yeah. Good. All right. So it's good. Go ahead. Was it, was it working? Yeah, yeah, it was working. Okay. It's not the duplicate option. Just don't click on the duplicate option. Okay. All right. So, a quick uh, stories in the political leaders that announced the latest shooting of the Jewish school in Montreal. So, there's been a rise in anti Semitism. Most of this is probably being stirred up with the uh, problems in the Middle East right now. That's violence. Violence is uh, not something that can be justified. And it's totally unacceptable that anything like this is, is happening. And it, it really has to uh, stop and uh, stop. Now, one little thing, Montreal is going to increase the registration tax for motorists to $150. That means that you're going to go from $59 a year for the license plate in your car to $150. And that is money that's going to be used to fund the public transportation, which has a roughly $500 million deficit right now. And they're trying to raise some money that way. So I'm sure they're going to find another way to get into our pockets soon enough. But public transit is still important because an awful lot of people need uh, uh, public transport to be able to get around. Weekend traffic from May 31st to the 2nd. For all you people who live out uh, in, in Claudia's Way, the Yellow Tort uh, closes streets around the southwest. Uh, oh, excuse me, Tour de Lille. Excuse me, I was looking at the uh, other, uh, uh, talking uh, the yeah. bridge. We see, we're, we, we see the black version, by the way. We see the back. So if you want to go back to full screen, you have to go back to your display settings and click on the first one. Yeah, click on okay. that. And then, I have you, no, 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 no. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's what I did before. Yeah, perfect. Okay. You're in full screen now. All right, so the weekend traffic for May 31st to June the 2nd, the Tour de Lille closes streets around the southwest. It is going to be a nightmare for trying to get around. So if you have a chance to avoid that and stay home, all the better, because it's going to be a nightmare while you're uh, in there. The PQ proposes a bill to have Quebec flag uh, displayed in every classroom and all landmarks. How about putting a little bit of money into uh, health care before we do that? Unsustainable trajectory. McGill expects a $91 million loss due to Quebec funding overhaul. It's it's not a not a good situation that's happening to the uh, higher education in English here in Quebec. MP advice to lock their doors and avoid meetings as death threats skyrocket. So uh, uh, MPs have there's more threats against them where there were. Was it in uh, 2019? They had, uh, what was it, eight. And now they have 530 in 2023. So they've really gone up an awful lot. Again, violence is not a proper thing. And it's a way that uh, people uh, uh, subvert uh, democracy. And we all have to denounce that. Okay, please don't forget to mark in your calendars for June 8th, which is English is not a crime. Um or excuse me, English is a crime. It is uh, a crime. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's yeah, the yeah. whole. Uh... <laughs> I'm so used to saying English is not a crime when I'm when I'm arguing with people. So come all, come one, come all. Please come and support us as we go in and we uh, go through the crowds and inform people and uh, get them to understand what's going on over here. And uh, that embarrasses the uh, government, which is a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, Mark Perez. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So thank you very much for that, Mike. I'm glad that we were able to, to fix that. So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Rahul uh, Majumdar. Rahul Majumdar is an esteemed academic and vocal advocate for linguistic and educational rights in Quebec. Known for his incisive analyst, uh, analysis and commitment to preserving the multicultural fabric of Canadian academia, Rahul's work often res uh, revolves around the intersection of language, policy, uh, and, and education. Longtime friend, I'm honored to have him here today. And Rahul, the floor is yours. I'm going to unmute you, find you. 
has to unmute. So just before Rahul starts, a few rules. Rahul is going to do his presentation. If he wants to, people to interrupt him with questions, that's fine. I prefer to go all the way to the end like that. Everybody can, uh, like that we could hear all of the uh, Rahul's presentation and then we could get into it. So when we get into the Q&A, I will explain how that's going to work. So Rahul, the floor is yours. Sounds good. And uh, do I have control uh, from you, Mark? Can yes, you can you can go you can go ahead and share. Okay, so share screen at the bottom green. Share screen at the bottom. Okay, share screen. There we go. There we go and I'll go in from the beginning. Yeah. Okay, everyone can see that. Yeah. Do you want to go full screen or um, you want to do the presentation like this? I guess yeah, I can go full screen. I think I can I should be able to do it from my end. Yeah, from the beginning. Okay, like that? Perfect. Okay. We see, yeah, we see the, the full, full screen. Okay, so, well, thanks everyone for your presence. As I told, or I've been away from activism a little bit lately for personal reasons and other reasons, but I'm happy to uh, dip my toe back in with this uh, presentation. I gave a little title to this. Uh, it is related, certainly, to the PQs. I guess you would call overture to the English speaking community with regards to Quebec independence. But I just wanted to maybe twist it a bit, make it a little more of a broader theme, a broader presentation. So I give you my title right there. And I really wanted to maybe look at it from a different angle or an angle that's not often spoken about, certainly not in the mainstream media. So I've called it maximizing the English speaking community's leverage in the current, and in brackets, I put future Quebec independence debate. So there we go. I give a little bit of more of my activist background. It's all starting from 2021, where I met up with folks like Mike and Mark at the Task Force of linguistic, on Linguistic Policy. And so this was the COVID area, the era. So, you know, through the Zoom meetings, I did technical duty. I set up a spreadsheets with politicians at all three levels. This was just as Bill 96 was being introduced. And we felt we had to get to these politicians somehow and say, bad, uh, we believe Bill 96 is for Quebec. I actually submitted a, a brief on Bill 96 to the National Assembly on my own, as well as contributing to the task force own brief, both of which I believe you can still access on the website. If not, you can always uh, contact me through Mark and I'd be more than happy to give it to you. Um, I was one of the original folks who got the Canadian Party of Quebec going in late 2021. Um, at the time, I'll admit to being a little bit skeptical. I wasn't sure if we could make things work, if we could, you know, forget about making winning seats, if it was actually worth it. But considering the situation at the time with Bill 96, with Bill C-13 at the federal level, or at that time, I guess it was Bill C-32 still, I said, okay, I'm going to go for it. And so I did go for it. I became the chief policy advisor with the Canadian Party of Quebec. Uh, we produced a 183-page document that unfortunately wasn't used very much during the campaign. But anyway, 32 people. I'm very proud of that achievement. And uh, we went forward. I went forward until basically November of 2022. And I left the party officially in February of 2023. Um, I attended, well, their task force events. Essentially, they were Mark's events in the summer and fall of 2023. We had uh, various car rallies, I believe, in the West Island, uh, in the Southwest, La Salle Verdun. We actually were at Roddick Gates talking about education before the announcement of the tuition hikes. 
So we had the event there and we had a nice event in Cote Neige NDG, where I believe, which was our largest event, I believe Mark can give me the numbers. I believe we hit maybe 400 people. At- yeah, we were, fi- it was 500. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a very good event. And I guess just to wrap things off in terms of my involvement was I was a guest speaker at Mark's Rally of Rallies event on December 30th, 2023. So while other people were on holiday and enjoying festivities, I was there speaking for about 20 minutes on the uh, tuition hike issue and the new French language proficiency requirements at McGill and Concordia. So that's the way I spent part of my holidays in case anyone was interested in knowing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So here we go more into the political overview and outlook. Um, This is mine personally. You're, of course, free to agree and disagree as we go along and get into the Q&A. So regarding the CAC, once high-flying CAC facing serious turbulence, They've dropped a second and a rather distant second, maybe surprisingly, to the Parti Québécois of all parties in recent mainstream polls. They had one m and I believe, step down because he intends to run for the Conservative Party of Canada next year, So, which is interesting. And they have lost some key staffers as well. So it's going to be very interesting in the next year. Will there be other CAC? either m as or personnel jumping ship as we approach a federal election. And I asked rhetorically, so we can discuss it in the Q&A, has Teflon Premier Francois Legault lost his touch? And is it possible that he does not personally contest the 2026 provincial election? Would he consider retiring after winning two majority mandates and say, okay, that's enough for me? Uh, I guess time will tell. We have the revival of the Parti Québécois fortunes. And with the revival of the PQ, inevitably, there is a renewed discussion about the so-called national question, Quebec status either within or outside of Canada. And certainly the spark for my presentation, as well as uh, I guess some of the discussion recently, has been the Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon's pitch to English-speaking Quebecers via English media. You may have seen it on television, you may have seen it on YouTube or other avenues, but rather interesting. And I talk about the Parti libéral du Québec, not because I want to, but arguably the rise in the PQ's fortunes maybe has given the Liberal Party a boost as well. Um, there was a recent poll, I think, where they actually got back into double digits with the Franco- with Francophones, which they certainly didn't have in the 2022 election and even into 2023. So it's going to be very interesting moving forward to see, especially as their leadership convention gets underway. Quebec Solidaire. They started, I believe, in the mid-2000s with nothing. It took them three elections, I think, to win a seat. But they finally got official party status uh, last year by winning the uh, by-election in uh, St. Henri, St. Anne. However, as you've been following in the news, you know that their co-spokesperson resigned after only five months and quite strongly hinted that there were internal problems as far as getting her message across and maybe dissension between Gabrielle Nadeau-Dubois' people and her people. So anyway, uh, they came out with a Saguenay declaration. I don't know if you mentioned that in any context, but it appears Quebec Solidaire is kind of going NDP from what I understand kind of going away from some of the more doctrinaire positions, some of their grassroots, and trying to be more electable. So again, that's a story to be told, I guess, in the future. And the last but not least, we have the ongoing implementation of Bill 96 and the Federal Official Languages Act revamp, also known as C-13. It's clearly an assault on Quebec's English-speaking community, And obviously, it's bad news. And right now, it doesn't appear that we have much help in sight. But we try and remain optimistic, and we try and move ahead.
as best we can. Here I'm focusing a little bit more on the English-speaking community of Quebec, ESCQ, as I put in the acronym. I feel it's been a very clear and deliberate abandonment of the community by all federal parties, certainly currently represented in the House of Commons. And there are all kinds of reasons we can talk about. Again, I'll leave that to the Q&A. Um, Arguably, the English-speaking community in Quebec saved Canada, you know, in 1980, certainly in 1995. And we don't really seem to be getting a lot of credit for that, you know, over the years. And I think that's just something we'd like to note. And either within Quebec or even outside Quebec, when we speak to people outside Quebec, uh, do you know that uh, our vote may have actually kept this country together? I just thought I'd throw that in. And I give uh, the various, in my view, the opinions of how current political parties look at the English-speaking community. Overt disdain is a term, is an expression I came up with. Grudging tolerance. Uh, QS does get some youth, some young Anglophone votes in the plateau and in the city. So I guess they have to show some respect. And there was actually a poll, I guess, a couple of years ago where it said the majority of QS voters were actually Federalist leaning, believe it or not. So they have to show some acceptance of Anglophones, I guess, in Quebec. Fake concern from the Parti Conservateur du Québec. Eric Duhem seems to have been CJAD's go-to person for a little while. He'd be on monthly, he'd show his concern or supposed concern for the community. PCQ is a very nationalist party, and given that they don't have any seats in the National Assembly, we really don't know what they really think about the English-speaking community as of now. And obviously, the Quebec Liberal Party has taken the community for granted for decades. Uh, there's a long story about that I don't want to get into. Uh, maybe more directly relevant for ourselves the next point, failure of two nascent, quote unquote, Anglo-friendly provincial parties to win seats in the 2020 election. And I called it, I'm calling it questionable grassroots enthusiasm for another third party attempt in 2020. Who's the failures? I want to know. Well, we can talk about that. Well, we know the two parties are referring to both the Bloc de Montreal and my old Canadian Party of Quebec failed to win seats and really didn't yeah, fail to win to a seat, seats. but not failure, outright failure. As I said, we can discuss that later. Uh, okay. I don't mind talking about it myself. We do have pockets of activism. Mark, Mark, Mike, fantastic examples of people willing to do something concrete on behalf of the community on issues of concern to English Quebecers. And we do have the pursuit of justice in the courts. It seems the courts are quite often the last resort for our community. So obviously we are challenging Bill 96, Bill 40 in terms of the English school boards. They still exist, even though Premier Legault has wanted to get rid of them and I suspect would still like to get rid of them. And my final point here is, do we risk going back to the bad old days of the PQ versus Liberal Party, Federalist versus Separatist dichotomy? Um, Premier Legault arguably won his first mandate by saying, we want to get rid of this Federalist Separatist debate. He offered the 10-year moratorium on referendums, which he actually carried out. So credit to him for that. But if the PQ stays high in the polls, does the Quebec Liberal Party benefit from that screen, if you will? So this question, again, I don't want any feedback right now. We can talk about it if this is a question that you'd like to answer. Is there a better, more meaningful way for the English-speaking community of Quebec to participate in the current and or future debate on Quebec independence. Maybe something to think about. And uh, from the point of view of the English speaking community, I mean, what do we have to offer as a community? Well, if you go by not necessarily the census of 2021, which is already out of date, 
but we are about 1.4 million people out of a population of 9 million in Quebec. So roughly 15% of the population. Significant if you compare us to Atlantic provinces, a larger population than all four Atlantic provinces, as well as Manitoba and Saskatchewan. We have a 260-year-old uh, presence in Quebec. And we have accomplishments in a whole range of fields. To discuss it would take probably another three, four hour presentation. I won't do that. Significant and growing levels of French fluency in both Montreal and the rest of Quebec mm -hmm. among mother tongue Anglophones and ethnic <clears throat> minorities, allophones if you prefer, whose first official language spoken is English. I think this is pretty clear. Again, if people want to dispute it, uh, we can always discuss it. But I think the Anglophone community, the English-speaking community as a whole has shown, for the most part, you always have exceptions, a willingness to learn French, to work in French, and certainly to encourage the use of French in their circles. The English community in Quebec certainly was a driving force that made Montreal the preeminent metropolis in Canada for about 150 years. Uh, you can choose your own start date and end date of those 150 years. I think it's pretty clear in that sense. And we always retain our ability to act as Quebec's window to English speaking North America and most of the world. And so in red, the English speaking community while may not have the weight in a typical election with a first-past-the-post system that we enjoy in Canada, when it comes to a one-person, one-vote referendum, 15% can definitely tilt the vote one way or the other. And that's just basic math. It's no real analysis required in that sense. So here's just something I kind of thought about as I looked at the coverage of SPP commercial on independence. Is it such a bad idea to reach out to Quebec separatists, including the Parti Québec and Quebec, uh, Quebec Solidaire, to gauge then their sincerity and trustworthiness, read the, let's say, the place of English-speaking Quebecers within their respective projects? PQ and QS are not exactly the same. PQ is all gung-ho about referendums. QS is more about, from what I understand, what they call constituent assemblies, bringing various uh, parts of society together to reach a consensus. And then I think if they felt they had a consensus, they would go forward with, in, with independence or an independence vote. So I would say from certainly the English-speaking Quebec point of view, I put in a couple of demands that I would want to ever consider Quebec independence being vi viable. The legal recognition of the English-speaking community's historical role in building Quebec, a formal recognition of the importance of English-speaking Quebecers in a future independent country, inviable entrenchment of rights, and I gave the examples that we're all familiar with, in any future Quebec constitution without being subject to a derogatory, i.e. notwithstanding clause, which has been a topic of conversation in other contexts in recent times. And as a demand, a declaration of Montreal as an officially bilingual state territory within an independent Quebec. So these are our demands. So what could the English-speaking community of Quebec offer in exchange for the fulfillment of these demands? Um, well, open what I call declarative support for Quebec's exit from Canada. Opposition to all partitionist and 11th province movements, as well as other attempts to remove Montreal from Quebec in the aftermath of a we, or yes, referendum vote. And uh, I put a note in that Indigenous peoples with the inherent right of self-determination will decide their own futures via negotiation 
with the government of Canada and the government of Quebec. And so I think we've come basically to the end. And I will end off with another question. At this point in time, what do English speaking Quebecers have to lose? And so with that, I will return control to Mark. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Rahul. If you can just start by stopping the sharing of your screen. Okay, we will do that. I will do that now. Okay. So. There we go. Perfect. I think Are I you stop. good, Mark? No, your your screen is still sharing. Still sharing. Okay, hold on. Here, I Let's think see. I could do that. Okay, yeah, I can. Yeah, I think I can do it. All right. One sec. I, no, I, 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 yeah, I took it. Okay. I, I take care go. of it on my side. Okay, so the way that uh, the conversation is going to go on for, for, for now, we're going to enter into the Q&A section. I've given permission for everybody to unmute themselves, so you're, you're, if you could unmute yourself. The way to ask a question is by raising your hand using the reaction button, which is on the bottom. If you click on the reaction, you click on raise hand, you're going to see on the top left that your hand is raised. If uh, you can't find it or you want to ask a question and, and you can't get to it, just uh, write in the chat that you have a question and I'll try to follow the, uh, the, the, the questions and who in what order. I'm going to put a timer of one minute. So if you can ask the question within a one minute time frame, and because, you know, Rahul, did a presentation, there's me and there's Mike. If you have any questions, just specify towards who you're asking the question to and just try to keep it to one minute and then the person's gonna answer. And if you have a rebuttal, then there's gonna be another one minute. And then after that, we're gonna go to the next person. So if you want your question to be answered again, you'll just have to wait for your turn after the queue. We did this last time and we lasted two hours. Remember to stay courteous and respectful. Uh, we're all here to discuss. That's the whole point of the think tank. So I see that the first person that they have the hand raised is Mike Crawley. So give me one second. I have the timer going. So go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. So, yeah, Rahul, a uh, couple things. One, you were wondering about uh, Legault. Would he uh, quit for, before the next election? <laughs> Legault comes from the PQ, and the PQ have a big habit of uh, eating their own leaders within a short amount of time eventually. So that's one thing I think. The other thing is you're wondering about, you know, a special status for us within Quebec. Um, would there, would they really respect that agreement? Cause they have a, a charter of rights and uh, freedoms that they uh, don't respect right now. So it's a big, big question. You know, maybe they would, but the next one coming in wouldn't. And if Quebec does separate, it's going to get eaten up by the United States in a very short amount of time. Uh, for it's, it's going to find itself extremely vulnerable. And once that happens, uh, it's going to just be the floodgates open, the dam is broken, and um, uh, it's going to flood the, the rest of Canada. Personally, that's what I think. I could be wrong. You could agree with me or not. Okay. So... So Rahul, that's go directed ahead. at me. Okay. Okay. So with regards to Legault potentially resigning, my idea is that politicians don't like to lose. And so as we go into the balance of 2024, into 2025, and even 2026, if the polls are, if the polls remain the way they are with the PQ within the lead, I don't know if that can hold a double digit lead, but in the lead, would Legault maybe risk a bit of his legacy and go into a losing election, potentially for him a losing election? I think he might have pause to consider his legacy at this point. He may be happy with his two majorities, with the imprint he's put in Quebec politics, certainly as premier. I think it's possible. I mean, we'll never know until we cross that bridge, but uh, I think it's possible. I think maybe one thing I'll make clear, maybe it might help future questions. I'm not 
proposing separation, I am throwing a possibility out there as far as what the English community should do if indeed this separation question goes back to the front burner. Now, we can argue and say, oh, the PQ, they're a flash in the pan. By the time we get to fall, they're going to be back down to whatever, 10, 15 percent. And we won't have to discuss this again. But I think we need to keep in mind as well, and I think everyone here knows that, is that there is always going to be a hard core, I would say 15 to 20 percent, a separatist core in the province of Quebec. So the issue may be in the back burner, it may be in the front burner, but it will remain in one form or the other. And if the PQ maintains its position in the polls, we're going to have to decide, do we put our heads in the sand or do we try to meet this issue head on, which I don't believe in my lifetime. English speaking Quebecers in general have done. They basically deferred to a small set of leaders, including those in the Quebec Liberal Party, and they say, well, they'll take care of it for us. Well, we're at this stage, I think, in part of, because of, in my opinion, poor leadership. So this is my idea of putting things forward, and please continue. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, Alan, Alan sorry, I was on mute. Do you hear anything in the background? No. My, I have the AC that's right next to me. I just, if you don't in hear the it, then I, I won't mute myself. No? Okay. No, we don't hear okay. okay. Perfect. So, Allah, go ahead. Okay. If there's a 15 to 20% hardcore separatist in the province, I'm part of the 15 to 20% hardcore federalists in the, part, in the province. I will never join the PQ. I will never vote for separation. I will not get into your discussion, Rahul, because for me, it's a non-starter. I will never participate in the separation movement. For me, it's a no-go. And uh, I've been at this now since 1974, 75, when Rabbi Bourassa came out with his bill 22, um, I, I think I told the story before. I was at Howard S. Billings, and we were called to the auditorium, and the principal basically told us, look to your left, look to your right. Next year, one of the three of you will not be here. Uh, and, and, and I have been fighting this fight ever since, sometimes with less knowledge, uh, but I am pretty much equipped with knowledge now. Yeah, and yeah. I would never, never, ever take part in or participate in the separation of Quebec. Uh, so for me, that this, this whole, what have we got to lose? I mean, what have we got to gain? If the question is not, what do we have to lose? Because we have got a lot to lose if we join the Quebec separation party. The, 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 there's no way they're going to respect the Anglophone rights in the long run. They they grudgingly do so now. And then whenever they run into a situation where they might be held up in the Supreme Court, they stick in Clause 33 and uh, try to sweep it under the rug. There's no way they're going to respect this. So it's not what do we have to lose that you should ask, is what do we have to gain by joining the separatist movement? We've got nothing to gain by joining the separatist movement, then I suggest that we don't do that. And me personally, I will never join. So <laughs> I leave it to there. Okay. Um, I, I don't think I there don't, was a question you. in there, so I guess we can move on. Well, the question was reversed. It's instead of what do we have to lose, it's what do we have to gain. And I think that the way that I, I understood Alain's preamble and, and the question was in there. The question is that basically if the PQ are going to be doing another referendum and this time it does look like there's going to be a majority and the fact that PSPP is coming to us to to, to participate in the referendum and, and to help win and the question is right now 
we saw that the federal government didn't come and help us with Bill 96, 21, 40, 23, 15, and all the other ones. So the, 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 the conversation for tonight is not, do we want to help separate? The question is, should we negotiate what we want out of Quebec? Because let's say Quebec separates and, and they win their independence. It's only Quebec and the federal government that could have a conversation about what's going to happen to Quebec. They're going to have to talk about partitioning the land. They're going to have to talk about the railway. They're going to have to talk about the waters. They're going to have to talk about the, the St. Lawrence River. So th the question is, should the Ang Anglophone community get be ready and say, well, if you really want to separate, this is the list of our demands and this is what has to be respected. And when the federal government negotiates with the, the, the Quebec government, you know, that's basically what the federal government has to has to apply. And I don't know if there's any legal recourses at the UN for this, but I think that's what we're talking about now, because with uh, partition, we found that we can't do partition pre-referendum and even post-referendum. We're still looking for a loophole and a solution, but yes. We can. We can partition post-referendum. We can do the same thing they did to Quebec, that Quebec did to Canada. We can do the same thing to Quebec. So uh, this, this, I heard that uh, you, what you were saying about uh, uh, being impossible to, set, to partition post-referendum. Post-referendum, the world is wide open, my friend. The world is wide open. And post-referendum, who knows what's going to happen. And I can tell you, Raul, right now, do not place any trust, any hope of trust in the PQ or the QS if they win a referendum and they separate. There is no way they're going to respect us. They don't even respect us now. So why would they respect us after they get a separation vote? Now, it's... Okay, I still don't have a question, but I'd like to say a couple of things. Number one, I the whole idea of this presentation is to open dialogue. And I think I have in my slides is that we want to have dialogue to gauge the sincerity of either the PQ or Quebec Solidaire or whoever, whatever other groups come up. And then if they say, oh, look, these guys, they're BSing us. It's, not, it's pointless to talk to them. If they want to win a referendum, they're going to need, well, I assume 50% plus one, unless there's other criteria. They can count the same way we can count. And at some point, someone in the separatist camp is going to say, geez, you know, we're going to need some of those English-speaking votes. And if that's the case, then we should be ready, okay, what would we want? What would we want? You know, forget about, you know, Canada, Quebec as people. What does the English speaking community want in a society that would make them happy? Now, I put in a couple of very general demands, but obviously, if this ever became serious, you would need people to actually do a decent negotiation. Okay, we want constitutional protections. We want Montreal as an officially bilingual city. Mark just said that he's spoken in his last, last week's show. He spoke to a constitution lawyer who basically nixed the idea of partition. Now, maybe that you'll find a constitution lawyer who says, yes, you can partition. You know, I, I don't want to get into that debate. My debate is the dialogue. And what I fear is that we're going to be left on the sidelines if this debate comes to the front burner. Right now, it's kind of still back burner, but the simmer has begun. And so I'll say what I said during my presentation. Uh, do you put your head in the sand and assume the separation debate's going to go away on its own? Or do you want to be proactive and say, look, the issue's out there. We need to deal with it. Thank That's you very I'm much. Uh... Thank you very much, Rahul. Next is Claudia, and after Claudia is Cynthia. She's having trouble raising her hand, but...
she messaged that she she would like to go next. So after Claudia. You're on mute, uh, Claudia. Yeah. My first, before I ask my question, I want to say something that it's not a given that they're going to win the next referendum. I disagree with you, Mark, and I disagree vehemently. All right. Mm -hmm. There's only a 33% support for independence in Quebec. And I, I find that very presumptuous to say that comment. Number two is partition is possible after a referendum. Definitely possible. It's part of the negotiation after a referendum. My question is, or my comment is, I don't ne negotiate with terrorists, okay? These people have never, ever had a benevolent bone towards us. And my country is Canada, and I'm not the only Anglophone. There are Francophones that feel the same way. This is my country. So what do we got to lose? My integrity. Anyway, I, I, I'm sorry you I get continue. emotional about these things, but I do. Claudia, you could continue. Don't mind the timer. You, keep going. If you want to add more, I'm, old, I'm older than you guys, you know, like, let's see, Mike is about my age. <laughs> I've seen it go through all the permutation and computations. You know, we had a much closer margin of support in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties. Independence does not have that support now. Why should they? They have sovereignty association anyway. They're getting everything they want. So why do they have to to separate? I mean, what what's the, what's in it for them other than bashing us? You know, like I I don't I don't see why the only Anglophones I know who would support such a thing is the ones who've thrown their hands up in the air because they don't see a way out. And if we can show them that there's somebody there who's going to help them show their way out, I believe that that's the route that they will go. You know, I mean, you may consider that certain new parties are failures. I don't. I, I see it as someone who started out small, very close to the election date, was not well prepared for an election. And who knows what's going to happen? A lot of new parties flounder in their first election. You know, they, they don't flounder continuously. There are surprises in elections all the time, you know. Who would have thought the NDP would win so many seats in Quebec, right? It's, it's, I find that very presumptuous. You know, I, I remember standing in line during the 80 uh, referendum and the 95 referendum. And we thought that, you know, we were doomed and, and we weren't. I mean, we might've gotten by by the skin of our teeth, but in those days, support for independence was much greater. The population is much younger now. They don't care about this stuff. You know, they, they want, like, as, as what's his name says, Legault says, kids want to speak English. That is his biggest problem is they want to speak English. You know, you go to a high school, you go to an elementary school. That's why they, the management may get on their case about it. But bottom line is the kids want YouTube. They want Netflix. They want this. They want that. And you know what? You're not going to be able to tell them what they have to do forever. They're going to become adults or they're already there. And so I don't, I really resent that presumptuous. I just don't, and I don't trust these people. I don't trust them. Why would we expect anything else from people who have shown us repeatedly that they don't care about us? Exactly. You know, it doesn't make sense. You know, I don't okay. believe in a benevolent, uh, there is no benevolent separatist. There is none. Okay. They will say what they have to say to get votes. Just like Plowendon, when he was going through Villamar and knocking on telephone doors, including my mother's and telling everybody, you know, the referendum, it may not happen for a long time and whatever. This happened during the by-election when they were trying to replace Long Lad's seat. Okay. And Plamondo said that, and now he comes out of his bloody convention, guns blazing, that he wants to do a referendum. You know what? I wasn't born yesterday, and I don't believe in that crap. Sorry, but it's okay. Rant. So it's all good. So okay, 
You don't have to raise your hand. I will. No, 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 no. I, no. I, I, I like to. Uh, okay. So sorry. Just give me one second, Cynthia. Okay, sorry. Uh, because Claudia made a Claudia made a statement. Rahul gets to reply, okay. sorry. and then if Claudia wants to add to that, she has mm -hmm. one minute, and uh, after that, you, it'll be your your turn. So I just wanted to make sure. But Rahul, the, Rahul, you don't have to raise your hand. You you get a, <laughs> a free get a pass free on pass? this. You mm -hmm. get a free pass. Okay. So go ahead. All right. Okay. I'm not surprised with some of this reaction I'm hearing, although maybe I wasn't strong enough. I said, look, this is not an offer to become separatists. My idea is to open this discussion. Okay. And I think Claudia in some ways is right. If we were to have this discussion and we expose the SPP as a fraud, that, you know, his TV commercial was, you know, just uh, just a shot in the dark from their point of view to get some Anglo votes for a potential referendum, then we'd, be, we'd easily be able to call them out. And we could use Claudia's argument, say, look, they're a fraud. They, they just want to get their 50 plus one, 50 percent plus one and move on. But I think we have to, especially after the past five decades, I mean, you're saying that they, I mean, you're, I'm guessing you're talking about separatists or nationalists or whatever, they already have what they want and you don't trust them. Well, a question that I would ask is that, do you trust anyone on the federalist side right now? Um, do I trust? Okay, let me finish, please. I don't. I Wait. I yes. don't trust the Quebec Liberal Party for as far as I can throw them. No. I don't trust anyone at the federal level, whether they be liberal, conservative, my Green Party, which I'll be leaving shortly, Bloc Québec, obviously, and Alain's sort of NDP. I don't trust any of them because they've all shown that they want to cater to ethnocentric nationalism in Quebec because they see the vote and they say, hey, do I go for the big chunk or the small chunk? And in their point of view, the big chunk is catering to nationalism, even in a federal election. So this question of trust, I don't think is relevant because you can't trust anyone. And that's why as a community, if we were able to come out and say, look, the debate is out there, as I said, if the PQ can hold their vote, whether we like it or not, separation, independence is going to be on the front burner again. And so the question is, how do we as a community react to that? Do we just say, look, we're going to ignore you and uh, you're going to go away. You'll never get more than 35 percent. I recall the 1995 referendum campaign, too. I don't you know, I won't give my age, but I do remember it. And the talk was, oh, it's going to be an easy victory for the no side. You know, nothing, no. you know. Oh, yes. Well, no. you can do your research okay. if you want. And then we saw how it ended up. So, you know, my idea is to be proactive. I don't know if being proactive is shutting down debate or if we suspect someone is not an honest player actually proving it which would be part of the purpose of this discussion. And it's very easy, as cynical as you may be to my proposal, if I went to the PQ head office right now, they'd probably give me the same reaction on the other side. They'll say, who are you? You're just Anglo, ethnic, uh, uh, you're trying to undermine our cause. So that's fine. I'm more than happy getting it from both sides. And, uh, but I do believe the discussion is still worth having. So I'll end it for now at that. Well, number one is you're assuming I'm a liberal, which is no, I did not. I, I assume no. nothing. Okay. I assume nothing. We have to organize. We have two years to get some seats in the, in the in National Assembly. We don't have to go, you know, the PQ and, and the Liberals have both put in egregious, egregious language legislation, and we don't have to kowtow to them and hope that they throw us a bone. You know, we, we build our own party, and, and it's going to be very difficult, but I personally do not believe 
that uh, that they're they've got a chance of winning the next referendum. They don't have it, you know. Allophones don't come to Canada to get Quebec to separate from the country. You know, I grew up in a allophone family, and that's not what they do. So, between you and me and the post. I'm going to find a party that represents my wants and my desires. And I will never out out to, because what I have to lose is my integrity and I won't do it. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. The next person in line is Cynthia. Hi, I, I echo Claudia's thoughts. I, I, ha I I'm of, of the opinion that the CAC, they were very, very, very smart, and they have effectively separated Quebec from Canada without actually separating. They have their cake, they ha and they're eating it too. Uh, they're eating it too. Um, I don't think the Quebec Frank, the Francophone Quebecers are stupid, and I don't think that a referendum. I think they like to talk about it. I really don't think they have the guts to go through with it for many reasons. Um, you know, people, especially homeowners. Okay. Uh, the currency like it would change it wouldn't be the canadian dollar they you know they wouldn't be getting money from canada like i i really don't see that happening i think they have everything they want right now and to your point rahul i know what you're doing you're trying to do i don't think we can effectively negotiate without leverage we have been ignored disrespected for decades they don't care about us we need leverage. If you want to negotiate, you got to bring something to the table. We need to find a loophole. We need to find something. Otherwise, they don't care about us. It's 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 obvious, and I don't trust them. Rahul, okay, can I answer? Okay. Oh, yes. I, I I think that was that was the title of my speech about leverage. Yep. Shall I repeat it for everyone? Maximizing the English speaking community's leverage in the current. And but in, we need to uh, find a future in Quebec independence. Sorry. Um, yes, oh, please. Yes, yes. Yeah, please, was, please let the rubble. Yeah, so no, I, I, I actually agree with that point. The community needs leverage. Yeah. How does the English speaking community get leverage? Does it get leverage by putting all their eggs in the Quebec Liberal Party basket? Some people will say yes will disagree. Forming your new party, yeah, hasn't really worked historically, but, you know, if people believe in that, they certainly can do that. We are a democracy, and if you feel your views aren't being represented with an existing political party, by all means, you know, form a party, get like-minded people with you, and, and you go about it. But you do so with the knowledge of what's happened historically. So I'll leave it at that. Again, the trust factor, you can go and you can discuss. And if you come away from your discussion saying, I can't trust that person. I can't trust SPP. He's a smooth talking, English speaking guy who went to Oxford and McGill and and, to, and university, I believe uh, Lund University in Sweden. And he's selling us a deal which, which is gonna keep francophones locked in, you know, you can, you know, that's great. But my point of view in my presentation was to say, okay, this issue seems to be coming back again and again, you know, like a bad cold. Is there something different that we can do this time around? Uh, as I said, to improve our leverage. And that's it. Well, can I Cynthia? just say... I just yes, I'll, say, you, I'll say it quick. Yes, yes, yes. So, you have a minute. You have a minute. Okay. So in terms of leverage, like as you said, this keeps coming back as a bad cold, and I'm I'm very tired of it, to be very frank. I just want to get on with my life and enjoy my life at this point. I'm thinking that we need to do something different. And I'm thinking like the Bloc Québécois on a federal level, we should have a Bloc, an Anglo Bloc here on a provincial level that's fighting for our rights. And, and they've got to always be there because the Liberals don't, defend us. They don't support us. They threw us under the bus. We've trusted so many and we've been screwed over and over and over. Didn't see a lot of what happened coming and we got blindsided. I'm thinking we need to do something novel. I'm thinking a block provincial Anglo party would be something different and they would definitely have our backs and, and you know, support our rights. 
which is what we need. And this now and going forward. Rahul? That was my thinking two years ago. And to some extent, it's still my thinking. I would only caution people to look at the recent history and even the not so recent history of third parties and or if you call them independents on the provincial scene, especially if they had a minority rights, let's say, focus. So, but I can't really disagree with anything you've said, Cynthia. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. So Stanley, I saw that you had your hand up before and it's not up. So do you want to ask a question? Do you hear me? Uh, we hear you, yes. Okay, I didn't have a question. I had a few comments. Am I allowed to do that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, first of all, I agree pretty well with what most of what Claudia has said. I disagree pretty well with what Raul has said. I am probably older than any of you, so if that's an issue, no problem. <laughs> uh, we need to keep working anytime you see these separatists or CAC posting something. Post something back to them. Do it in both languages. That gets more reaction. Legault used to put everything on the top of Facebook. He left it open and he got out of there because people shut him down with everything he did. The majority of francophones, no way in hell, are interested in separating. That I would bet money, Mr. Raul, with you anytime. The notwithstanding clause was put in there originally because Mr. Trudeau Sr. and the others involved assumed that some in the future would have some integrity and you could trust them. You can't. You will not be able to. That doesn't mean play dirty. It means Keep that in mind all the time. You cannot and you should not rely on what they say. I don't have much more to say. I don't spend a lot of time on here, and I'm sorry I came in late, and I'll be leaving early. If anybody has a comment they want to give back to me, give it to me now. I can get it if you want. <laughs> Disagreeing with me is fine. I expected it uh, coming in. But the question, you know, and, you know, I... It wasn't exactly rhetorical. I say, at this point, what does the community have to lose? I said that in the context of, okay, I've heard talk that, well, you know, uh, separatists already have what they want. Legault has basically separated Quebec within a united Canada. If we go back to the Yvon Deschamps phrase of the, the independent Quebec within a united Canada. And he's not hiding that fact. They are an autonomist party. They believe very strongly, even more so, I would say, than Alberta in provincial rights. And he's taken it pretty much to the max. And uh, they're not finished. I mean, he wants immigration, basically exclusivity in immigration. And I'm sure there are more things on the list, you know. So uh, that's never going to stop certainly within Canada, and if there ever was a hypothetical independent Quebec down the road, maybe it wouldn't stop either. But I'm not sure. Stanley wanted to bet me something. I, I don't know what the bet is, but I'm if you're again, yeah. I'm telling you the majority of Quebecers, yes. and I do circulate around quite a bit, are not in favor with separatism. They like what Legault's doing only because we, the non-Francophones, are not keeping them informed as to where and how much they're being lied about. That applies to Legault, and it, it applies to this other Yahoo that's trying to put separatism out there in English now. It's BS. No. I'm lied to by separatists and federalists 24-7, and I take it in stride. So that's where I come from. Don't forget okay. the CAC. <laughs> was looking for English votes when they started, right? Yes, Mark? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And what did they do to us? Right? Well, they had their agenda and they did what they did. But they told <laughs> they us lied. they would look out for us yeah, and they, they didn't. Lied. Yeah. Okay. I don't hear Mike talking very much. He's not sleeping, is he? No, 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 no. Oh, he's, no. he's on. Mike he's is waiting absorbing. His turn. He's absorbing the so, debate. <laughs> So one thing that I want, wait, Mike, you're, you're on mute or we don't You're hear on you. mute, Mike. No, he's not on mute. This is okay. your, your mic is, 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 is silent or low. 
Because you're not on mute. No, we can't hear you. No, something is, uh, your, your mic is showing that you're unmuted and everything, but we can't hear you. So while you figure that out, I'm going to, to, to say something to Stanley. Yes, go ahead. So, so you know, you know me, you've, and I'm, you followed my, my career through the task force and everything that uh, we've been doing. Oh, there you go. Okay. There you go. Let's hear it, Mike. <laughs> so, wait, just uh, one minute, Mike. I just want to finish my thought. So I do agree with you that getting the word out to the Francophone is, is very challenging and very difficult, which is precisely why we have these advertising campaigns that we want to promote on the, on the Francophone side and stuff like that. Um, we need to continue to, to grow our reach. We need to expand. We need to invite people to our, to our, to our chat, to our conversation for it to continue to grow. We need to continue to spread ourselves across the board to get the message out. We need to fundraise and stuff like that. So on, on that regard, I agree with you that definitely we need, they, they need to know. And the only way that we could do it is by advertising. So if you're willing to help us on, on that end, as always, my door is open. Mike. Just saying that was, being a good lad, not talking out of turn. So, but you know me, I can get talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Stanley, um, do you want to say anything? No, I mean, with regards to what you just finished saying, Mark, as far as I'm concerned, something that works is those pins against 96. 90% yep. of the people do not have what it takes just to wear it. I wear it 80% of the time and you'd be surprised with the reaction you've got. And I've never had anybody that got rowled enough that I felt like slapping him in the face. They are well, you're going to have to add uh, new ones to your collection because we just designed a new one uh, today and it was, it was pretty you, nice. You got to carry the little paper that explains what it is though because 90% of them don't have a clue. Uh, so speaking about that, I, I guess you missed my few slides there, but on June 8th, we are printing 10,000 flyers and we'll be giving them up across Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mike, did you have something to say? Yes, Mike, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to be a little more, a little clearer. So the pamphlets are going to be uh, uh, handed out at the Grand Prix weekend. So downtown, and uh, we're going to be handing them out to mostly tourists who are down there. And uh, it, nothing gets the government to start uh, backpedaling on on eliminating Anglo rights as uh, uh, rubbing their face in the dirt in front of the uh, the world. Um, so if you, if you can uh, make it out, it would be fun to see you. Uh, I don't know what you're up to there on the 8th, but... Be nice. You can wear. We're going to give you extra no ninety six pins too. No, oh, I, new I ones. Think, I think I'm at a funeral in the West Island, but I'm not sure. Well, oh. just oh, don't boy. have too much time at the wake and come join us. <laughs> <laughs> or or oh, just pull a weekend at Bernie's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And sorry for your loss. No problem. Yeah, condolences. And I'm going to have to leave you, people. I missed the first part of this, Mark. Yeah, uh, I got in a little late. So, is this this was recorded? It was recorded, and as soon as I uh, put the watermark on it, it's it's gonna it's gonna be sent out. I'll meet. I'll be meeting with one of your friends tomorrow. Grand, what do they call him? Papa, Grandpa, something. He's on the radio down here all the time. Uh, I can't even think of B Santori. Oh, B Centauri, yes. He just met Amazing. with some of you guys. He just met with some of you guys last weekend, I believe. Yeah, whoever went to 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 Irwin's Irwin's meeting. Yeah, I was coincidentally I was having the the rally in front of Lego's office, but I I'm looking for people who actually went. Yeah, well, anyway, I'm gonna have to leave, gentlemen, ladies. Sorry. So thank you, Stan. Stanley, always a pleasure. How's the witch? Always a pleasure. Oh, the pleasure is mine, eh? <laughs> of course it is. Thank you. Bye, of course Mr. it Sanders. is. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So pretty much it's, what time is it? 10.30? 9.30. Okay. So it's 9.30 and nobody has their hands raised. So 
if somebody Norberto, has a question. Norberto, do you have something to ask? Do you have oh, a question Roberto? for us, Norberto? Hi, good evening. Sorry about my voice. I still have my sickness, but I'm okay. Uh, Mark, can I rebroadcast this if, you, if it is okay for you? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, can I rebroadcast it? To... Absolutely. Okay. Yes, so, absolutely. Can you send me a copy of it? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. Hi, to Alan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. See you tomorrow night, Norberto. Are you going to be at the induction? I don't know. It depends. Okay. Mm -hmm. Get so, uh, Tony, I know Tony tried to raise his hand. So, Tony, if you'd like to, you could unmute, and the floor is yours. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question I'd like to ask everyone. Sure. What is more important to you? The concept of Canada or the concept of individual rights? Raise your hand. That's a conundrum. <laughs> That's a conundrum. I mean... I mean... I think that they go hand in hand and we're supposed to have Canada with rights. And so I'm, you know, Canada, the concept of Canada is very important to me, but with it come the rights. I mean, I, I don't, they're in, inalienable. It, it, we're, we shouldn't be, be even fathoming that, that, that thought. Uh, Something happened to me 35 years ago. A friend of mine gave me three or four photocopies from the Confederation debates. And the Fathers of Confederation were very wise. There was no province of Quebec prior to 1867. It was created with the creation of Canada. So there was a concern on the part of numerous Anglophone Fathers of Confederation that there would be tyranny of the majority. Would the rights of the soon to be minority Anglophones of Quebec be violated by the majority. And the promise was given that if that ever happened, and it was outrageous to even think that this would happen, if that ever happened, the federal government had powers, numerous powers in the BNA Act that survive today, that the federal government would come in and veto such rights violating legislation yeah. by a province. Uh, although those veto powers have been used numerous times up until about 1944 in Canada, not once were they ever used to protect the minority rights of uh, Anglophones in Quebec or Francophones in other provinces outside of Quebec. So our rights are not inalienable, unfortunately, according to how the federal government has performed, and they violated that sacred promise and covenant of, of confederation. And the final thing I'll say on that is, and his name escapes me at the moment, but the professor who first introduced the concept prior to the charter's adoption of the concept of the notwithstanding clause, at the same time said, look, he says, don't worry about uh, the notwithstanding clause being used by a provincial government to violate rights because we have the safeguard of the veto power, the disallowance power, and other powers in the Constitution, whereas if that was ever done, the federal government would step in and notwithstand the notwithstanding clause invoked by a provincial government. They have not protected us. The federal government's more interested in getting the 80% francophone vote in Quebec than in protecting us. So my message to you is when the promise, the sacred promise of confederation is broken, you break the promise of the deal. And that deal is Canada. We must do what Raul, Rahul has suggested and think about other alliances. And my question about what's more important, minority rights and individual rights or the concept of Canada? Canada is a great concept, but there's more there's other concepts more important, and one of those is individual rights and minority rights. And I suggest to you that we should consider that when approaching the separatists, if indeed they're inviting us to speak to them. 
Well, we plan to take the English as a crime rally to Ottawa. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that, because they, they haven't listened to us for 50 years and they won't listen to us anymore. There's one like lone it's, voice. It's all about embarrassing. It's all about yeah. embarrassing people. But it's also but before, making people aware, we, right? Yeah, just Alain has his hand up. I just, I would like to keep that, oh, I'm uh, sorry, that order. No, no problems. So Alain, go ahead. Tony, I seem to remember the Quebec Act predates Confederation. The Quebec Act was put into being by Guy de Carleton, Lord of Dorchester, when the, Ang when the English took over the province of Quebec, or New France. And it was signed by George III, King George III. So there was a province of Quebec, and there was thought about Quebec before Confederation, way before Confederation. I think your history is wrong. The professor who told you that put in the notwithstanding clause and said to the others that there was nothing to worry about was, well, in my opinion, very naive. Because even at the time of the passing of the 1982 Bill of Rights, the, the PQ was already just chomping at the bit to, to use the notwithstanding clause that was put into the Confederation or the, the constitutional document in the hopes of attracting them to sign on. So they, they put this in in the hopes of attracting them, and they they, they said, okay, put it in, and they put it in, and then they just said, okay, we're not signing anyways. So um, I think that there's, there's, there's some stuff missing in your information. A lot. <laughs> I think a lot. So uh, I'd like to respond if I may. I'd like to respond. I'm a historical, I study history and human uh, rights on yeah. an ongoing basis continuously. So okay, I'm, the geo. The geopolitical entity that immediately preceded Confederation was something called the United Province of Upper and Lower Canada. It was a unified state uh, government that was governed by majority vote. So that's the reality that uh, preceded immediately preceded Confederation. As for George III, I just think it's interesting to note that if you read the United States Declaration of Independence, which is a collection of complaints by those separatists in the United States wanting their own country, it was a list of complaints. One of the complaints is that a neighboring province, which was a reference to Lower Canada, which was Quebec, that a lower, uh, the a neighboring province was uh, removed of its common law. So that I think, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that was a reference to the Quebec Act. So certainly our American friends were very unhappy about uh, the Quebec Act, but I just mentioned that uh, as an aside. Quebec Act, what it guaranteed was it guaranteed that the- Sorry, um, Alain, yeah. is there any way you could increase the volume of your you're my, because I, I hear everybody's trying to, and I'm my, using, my speak. I'm, I'll speak louder. I'll speak louder. How's that? Because I'm using the mic from the, better. from the computer. Yeah, so, it sounds better. So the Quebec Act guaranteed the French language. It guaranteed Roman Catholic religion, and it guaranteed uh, control of, of education. And it guaranteed also the civil code, the Napoleonic civil code for the province of Quebec or Lower Canada, however you want to name it. But the, it, the act is called the Quebec Act. So they actually knew about Quebec and they knew that it would be a province or they had intentions to make it a province. I think that what happened afterwards was some got scared and they said, okay, let's unite these two so that we don't have the French taking over. Because at the time, the French were the majority in Canada. So the Anglos were the minority. So they, they, they wanted to make their minority stronger. So that's when they joined the two provinces together and called it Canada, the province of Canada. But it was Lower Canada and Upper Canada before that and after that too. So it, it, there, there was a whole bunch of transition phases, but they did recognize the Napoleonic Civil Code, 
the French language, Roman Catholic education, Roman Catholic church, and the, that the province could retain the power over education. And that found they were the big uh, lines of the Quebec Act, and it took yeah. Guy de Carleton, Lord of Dorchester, quite a while to get uh, George III to sign on to this thing, but he did finally, and that's and he got him to sign on by saying to George that if he didn't sign on to this thing, that they would have all kinds of trouble with the French in 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 Quebec in Lower Canada. So that so, was that was last the, last was rebuttal. And then Rahul, and then we could come back. Okay, so yeah, Tony, upon, last. Upon that foundation, which you just laid out, was the BNA Act, within which were those protections for minorities. Now, the other thing I wanted to also mention, which I mentioned in the comments section, was that the notwithstanding clause was not an offer to Quebec, it was an offer to the NDP, I think the Saskatchewan government, because they were also a holdout. And the NDP government or governments, provincial governments, wanted a notwithstanding clause in there. But again, we have to remember the notwithstanding clause can be overridden by uh, the disallowance clause, uh, the reservation power. And there's numerous other powers. You mentioned education. Well, there's the remedial education clause, which is still, uh, although it's been amended a bit, uh, it, it's still in power in section 93. That allows the federal government to step in and fix any legislation by a province that violates the rights of minorities. Okay, I'll just hold your thought because I see you have something. Rahul, <laughs> you have your hands raised, so go ahead. Oh, we got I don't know. I, I don't know if you guys view the same way that I do, but if you go to the top right corner of uh, your Zoom, if you're on a computer, there, there's a view button. And I have it on gallery. So I see everybody in, at the same time. To me, that's the best way to, to see what's going on. So that's my input. But Rahul, go ahead. Okay. I recall from my history class that uh, the Quebec Act was considered one of the intolerable acts by the American separatists. And it certainly did lead to the uh, American War of Independence. So I just throw that as an aside. For people who are interested in the uh, repatriation debate and so on, the National Film Board has some excellent films. Uh, including the champions, which relates to it. It's champions is more a Trudeau versus René Lévesque type. Uh, th if those of you are familiar with it, but I highly recommend it, even if it's maybe a second or third time. Uh, it really puts the debate, the constitutional debate, in its true context. Other than that, maybe to Tony's question, do I value Canada? Or do I value do I value individual rights more than I value Canada? Yes. I value a country where my individual rights will be respected. Now, I would say for maybe 90% of my life, I thought that was Canada. And I would never even think about an independent Quebec. You know, I'd say, geez, you know, I'm gonna be a minority, I'm gonna be a linguistic minority. I'm already an ethnic minority, so I'm used to that. But I'll clearly be a linguistic minority. And gee, I don't know if what my place is going to be in that type of society. But as I've seen in the past couple of years, the federal government is not really beyond putting the English-speaking community in its place. And it's not restricted to Justin Trudeau. Uh, the conservatives are just as bad, if not worse. The NDP, Alain's NDP, I mean, they are arguably oh, the authors of asymmetrical federalism, yeah. where they came out and said, yes, I mean, uh, Quebec is different. They need to be treated differently. And a whole series of uh, what I found rather detestable. It's one of the reasons why, even though on a lot of issues, I'm probably on side with the NDP, uh, I could never get myself to vote NDP because they look at me as an English Quebecer, as a second class citizen anyway. So why would I bother with them? And I think I mentioned that I've been a Green Party member for a number of years, although I'm lapsing it. 
they pretty much gone along the same road as far as in spite of my best efforts to get them on side with English rights within Quebec, uh, to get away from nationalism. They're really no different either. And it's really unfortunate, I think. But I'll just go back to my main point of the presentation. It's not to support separatism. It's to open up the debate and say, okay, as a community, in our interests, let's get into the debate. If we shut it off right away, then we have no leverage at all. If this, uh, if what comes to pass, if the PQ somehow from four seats were to form the next government, especially if it's the majority government, then we know for sure we're going to have a referendum. And maybe the polls say 30% or 35%, but it was pretty much that in the lead up to the 95 referendum. And it ended up as 49.2. Arguably, it was on a trick question, but I mean, those are details. So that's it. So yes, National Film Board does useful stuff. There's some great films. Maybe Alain is already familiar with them and Tony is already familiar with them. For those of you interested, I highly recommend that you uh, take a look at those films. And uh, okay. that's it for me. So there's two things uh, before uh, Claudia goes next. So first of all, if you could send a list of the films, that would be good. I'll send it part of the email like that people can can see it. And the second thing that I, I have to ask everybody to keep in mind is do not call out people's affiliation to a party or anything like that, because we don't know where people stand. And I know that Alain has left the NDP. So, you know, it's not my liberals. It's not my CAQ. It's, it's, let's just try to keep uh, okay, those no, two I'll things apologize. separate. I did it in the context of, well, who's looking out for us? And that's why I mentioned everyone, you know, I mentioned all the parties at the federal yeah. level. No, no, so I did the, it in the, the show. No, so naming... I'll apologize. I'll apologize up front. So Alain, yeah. no, no harm meant, no harm intended. Pox on all their, all these parties. <laughs> yeah, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that you called out the party. It was just the fact that you associated somebody to that party, like calling out the party. I understand, but let's keep our associations out of the conversation. Claudia. I just wanted people to bear in mind that as deplorable as the federal government's actions have been in not protecting our community, that it is the Quebec government's actions that are propelling all of this. And although what the federal government did is kind of unforgivable. The reality is if, if, if we can make a dent on the provincial level, there will be no choice but to make a dent on the federal level. You know, they're kowtowing to what they think happens here. And I think they all threw us under the bus, every one of them. They don't care about our community. They just don't, you know. But I think that if we could become, if we can carry weight within Quebec politically, I think that we have a bit more clout with the federal government too. Right now, we don't. You know, I so, find that. Um, if, Rahul, if you have, sorry, are you done, Claudia? No, go ahead. Okay. So, Rahul, I don't know if you have an answer, but I'll, I'll chime in on this one. So, the Official Language Act is asymmetrical. The fact that the rest of Canada, the French has not, you know, it's not like people say that we live in a bilingual country, but when a Francophone needs to get services in Alberta and Saskatchewan and all that, and they can't, you know, I, I, I understand where the Francophones are coming and saying, okay, that's not fair. I know that C32 slash C13 and Bill 96 were, were done in conjunction. I got confirmation by when I, when I was talking to somebody who, who was privy to the conversations that were going on. I disagree with the fact that Quebec was able to get away with removing the Anglophone right to, to services and everything. I think that it should have been, we should have been the, the, the model to, to have across Canada. And we saw that the PLQ just said that, 
I think Mark is Mark Tongay part of the he's part of the PLQ, liberals. right? Not yeah, the Liberals, but provincial, right? Yeah. Mark Tongay okay. is the interim leader of the Quebec Liberal Party. Yeah. So so when I read him saying, "Oh, you know, I want uh, Canada to be uh, to, to whatever his comment was, uh, francophone by 2050 or majority." Francophone by 2050, it goes to show that there is a plan. There was a plan, and and this is the plan that they put forward. Um, so there is a conspiracy to to make French better across the across the board, and obviously the federal government has sold us out at that level. And that's why when I when I carry the flag or when I have these meetings, I always have the Quebec flag and just the Quebec flag because that's my that's my my way to protest at what the federal government has done. And it's, it's truly unfair that if they want to claim that Canada is a true bilingual uh, country, then it has to be from, from the East coast to the West coast. And uh, they should be giving Quebec back all the rights. And if it's to be uh, equal, it has to be. Now, every time that we post things on, on Facebook and for our June 8th event, we have these people that come on and they take a picture of Quebec and they show like what the Anglophone community has in Quebec and they try to compare it to what Francophones have in Ontario. And I say that's the silliest of arguments because the Anglo there there's always been a strong presence of the Anglophone community in Quebec. And as you know, as time went on, people started moving to the West. The the Francophones took more time to move to the West. So not in Ontario. Not in Ontario. No. Oh, but Ontario is one of the exceptions because it was run next door. But if you go past Ontario, okay. Yeah, but is it is it fair to ask people in BC who have one percent of their population francophone to take on bilingualism when it's at one percent? I don't find 1%. that a fair request. Well, the question. Okay, so the question. So my question I is: I mean, we can't even get like forty percent. Sorry. The, the question. So my question to that is. It, are they teaching French in BC? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, there are French minority language schools, according to Section 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I just ran into someone yesterday while crabbing whose son goes to a French school. But my question is not, is there a Francophone school? I want to know if on the English side, like here, we have the English Montreal School Board, right? And here, they have a French immersion, and they have French courses. So the students that graduate from an EMSB school can have a conversation with a Francophone. So my question is, BC, Mark, I know do they have the it. same? They're doing it in Alberta. They're doing it in BC. Yeah. They teach French okay. regularly in public schools. Yeah, I know and, people and that take just they have French go. immersion in, in that BC. has the program. And, okay, and so, so what I'm saying is, my argument is that I understand that the Saint-Jean-Baptiste project, their whole objective was to promote French across Canada. And I know that they're succeeding because, succeeding, successful, successful. I know that they're being successful because last year, for the francophonie they were promoting how there's one million new unilingual francophones across canada so i know that french is being promoted across canada i do believe that the rest of canada has to catch up to quebec i disagree with the fact that quebec had to remove the rights of the anglophones right. like it, it it shouldn't have happened here we the studies showed from the from the census of 2021 to, to the census of the OQLF, French has never been in danger in Quebec. It's never been, and the fact that they provided the services in English, and the OQLF came out and said, "Well, French is not in danger. It's actually been very stable." It goes to show that it's a whole sham. So I do agree with that, and and that's what I want to say. On, on the Official Language Act and the Bill 96, it was, a, it was a coordinated effort between the federal and the provincial. A lot of people thought that when C-32, when Trudeau came out with C-32, I don't know what you call it, when a government has to go through re-elections, but it was basically tabled. And everybody said, oh, well, that's the end of, of C-32, but they brought it back. So to me, 
there was a plan for that. And that's what I want to say. It's they have to give back the Anglophone community their rights back because there was no reason to take it away. There's no uh, in danger. I do agree yeah, with the rest it, of Canada. They incorporated that Bill 96 in their law. Yeah, I, and, and I completely and, and, did that. And if we didn't have Bill 96, they wouldn't be part of their law. That's right. And I completely no, see, agree that it has to be removed. Can I say something about this comparison wanna, between... Just before, I want to say, I want to go to Alain because I, I know he was about to say something and I know Raul has his hand up. So... You'll be right after Rahul. I'll laugh first. I, I was just saying that the only thing I just wanted to, to, to come up louder there, the Alain. About the, French, <laughs> the French going down. Hey, I'm going to shout now. <laughs> the only thing about French going down in usage is mother tongue French. The, the Quebecois are not making enough babies. There's nothing anybody can do about that. Uh, there's no um, no abolition of Ingl Anglophone rights is going to make Quebecois make more babies and give you more mother tongue francophones. I myself, with a name like Alain Charbonneau, I am mother tongue English. My mother's name is Joan Barry. We were raised in a English household. My dad would complain all the time, but she would just roll her eyes and say next. So it's it's the way it is. I mean, if you want more mother tongue francophones, you got to give, I don't know, some kind of aphrodisiac to the uh, francophone. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll comment after after Tony, but I, uh, I have an idea for that. So are you done, Ella? Yeah. Yeah. Rahul and then Tony. Okay, so Canada, I mean, linguistically is very asymmetric in terms of your English-French mix. Quebec, we're about 85% Francophone. New Brunswick is about 33, 35% Francophone, and that's mostly concentrated in Acadie. Ontario right now is a roughly 4% Francophone. I know historically it was maybe 10, 12%. Maybe someone can turn at its peak. And then it precipitated, as you go west, it drops into the low single digits. So I think as much as, you know, it's great to say, you know, we should be bilingual coast to coast. Uh, the reality is, is we have a Francophone belt, basically from Eastern, Northern Ontario, going through the national capital region. That's Ottawa, not Quebec City into Quebec and into northern New Brunswick. That's just reality. So to go to the person in Calgary or Vancouver or Medicine Hat or Moose Jaw and say, well, you've got to be perfectly bilingual by the time you leave high school, as laudable a goal as that is, it's just not going to happen. Now, the motivated Anglophone who wants to go into the federal civil service or wants to become a lawyer, or wants to go into politics. The sell of being fluent in French is not that difficult. Otherwise, it is very difficult. So I think on the whole, though, the federal government over the years has done a fairly decent job, you know, with the Official Languages Act, you know, up to C-13. Um, I think they... It was a sincere effort to bring francophones into the federal civil service. It was a sincere effort to put French on the same, at the parallel of English as an official language in Canada. And we see it in the politicians over the past number of generations. You know, the prime ministers are almost de facto from Quebec from the late 60s up until Stephen Harper. So I think we should celebrate some of those victories and continue. I mean, we're roughly 18% uh, bilingual or people who self-identify as French bilingual, French English bilingual across the country. It's not great, but it's, it's a good accomplishment. And I think as we become, you know, more and more globalized, there is a potential for that, you know, being good 
for the growth of French in Canada. You know, you may have people in Alberta and BC say, you know, I think I'd like to be bilingual or even trilingual. Yeah, I think I'm going to brush off my high school French. And even if I don't get a chance to use it, maybe I can start a moitié moitié club or I can find some more courses or do things online you know, to, to help me with the French language. So, and I speak as someone who didn't speak a word of French before entering primary school. And although I haven't proved it in this particular session, I'm not bad in French. Maybe Mark can attest to that. I don't know. So I'm, I'm all for language and I'm all for the learning of language at the individual level and at the governmental and let's say official level. But when it comes down to rights, I mean, you know, the question that Tony, again, I'll refer to it as I close, do I favor individual rights or do I favor Canada? I would love to have Canada Why as the expression. Choose? I would, well, it, it seems that we have to choose more and more no, because, uh, may I finish, please? Um, if you're going to pass bills like Bill 96 and B. D13, and if the federal government doesn't use its power of disallowance, then if I'm an English-speaking Quebecer, I have to ask questions, if nothing else, which is part of why I made this presentation. So there you go. I think that'll be my last word for the night. I will yield. All right. So Tony, and then me, and then Claudia. I wanted to make a comment in response to the discussion about comparing the rights of Anglophones in Quebec to those of Francophones outside of Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, and it centers around uh, two concepts, critical mass and economies of scale. There's approximately 1 million non-Francophones in Quebec, give or take 100,000. 75% of those 1 million non-Francophones in Quebec live within a 25 mile radius Placeville Marie. Okay. When you have a critical mass of that size, it's easy to have your own universities, your own hospitals, your own uh, social services structure. Francophones outside of Quebec stretch from St. John's, Newfoundland to Victoria, BC. Again, approximately a, a million non Francophones outside of Quebec, give or take 100,000. The province with the highest percentage of Francophones outside of Quebec is New Brunswick with you know, 35, 40%, whatever it is. The two cities with the highest number of Francophones in New Brunswick are Moncton and Edmonston. And if you've ever driven in New Brunswick as I have, it takes you five hours to go from Moncton to Edmonton. So you don't have either critical mass of, or economies of scale for Francophones outside of Quebec. So to make this comparison between the services and the institutions and the infrastructures for Anglophones in Quebec with those of Francophones outside of Quebec is incredibly asymmetrical. Of course, mm -hmm. when you've got big numbers, it's very easy to have those institutions and structures, which we did in Montreal. If you want to really make a genuine comparison, there's a little fishing village on the north shore of Quebec. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's close to Newfoundland. It has Grand Sablon. Grand Sablon. It has a majority English population, but there's only 3,000 people there. Well, compare the rights of the, people, the Anglophones of Blanc Sablon with the rights of Francophones in Moncton, New Brunswick. The uh, people of Moncton, New Brunswick, the Francophones, have far more rights and institutions and services than do the Anglophones of Blanc Sablon. So it's it's an asymmetrical comparison. That's what I wanted to say. Well said. So two things uh, that I wanted to, to bring up. I forgot what the second thing is, so I'll go with the first. Regarding to Alain's comment, the the number of babies wasn't there something in the in, in those days that the more babies you had the more the government would subsidize or something like that yeah is that, is that still in the, yeah but bonus. isn't it is that still in effect or is that complete has that been removed well now it's been moved into the family allowance of the families so when you get to the third and fourth child your family allowance like really doubles and triples, it, it, it goes nuts. When you get to a fourth child, 
it's almost a source of revenue. Yeah. They okay. call it cash crop sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Children are cash crops. I've heard that <laughs> saying many times. Wow. Uh, my experience is they cost more than what you get in. Doesn't matter how much they give you. <laughs> Depends what kind of a parent you are. Well, uh, hey, yeah. I've been divorced twice, buddy. No, 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 no. But I mean, I, I've seen, I've seen it where they've been a cash crop, and 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 the parent, one of the parents or two of the parents got the money. Anyway, yeah. my digress. So, okay, so I don't remember what my second thing is. So, Claudia. Just to answer your question, Mark, it had to do with the church. It was their way of playing the population balance. The mm. revolution of the cradle, it's called. Re revenge of the cradle. Or the revenge or whatever. And it yeah. was done to increase their numbers because they were afraid that they were going to get outnumbered. And the church didn't want to be outnumbered by Protestants. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that I, that I understand. So I, yeah. I think I remember my second my second statement. The um, it, it's in reference to what Rahul said, where students graduating from from high school or yeah from high school out west have to have perfect bilingual be perfectly bilingual. That's my interpretation of 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 what Legault is trying to do and 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 Frenchization and stuff like that. Lego says that, you know, we must be able to communicate. And personally, as long as you can have like a conversation with someone about needing something, exchanging something and stuff like that, I think that your level that that's the level of proficiency that you need. If you are if you're referring that, you know, everybody in Alberta has to be able to read a contract in French, get medical services in French and understand all the the, the French terminology, I think that's pushing it too far. I think, I think the goal is that if somebody comes over to your house for like a cup of sugar, for eggs or something like that, there's that, there's that form of exchange that could happen. If somebody goes to a store and, you know, they're asking for the pricing of something or they want a shoe size and stuff, I think that dialogue has to be able to happen. I think that's the level of communication that we need. I I went to five years of, of, of summer school in French because like the grammar and, and the structuring and stuff, I was shit at it, but I was able to, I was able to, to speak it. I was able to like, they told me like the, the stories that I wrote for my, my, my ministerial exams and stuff like that, they were incredible, but you know, I made a mistake writing my own name. So it, it, it is a difficult language and, and to, to ask people, and this is where I, I find the biggest hypocrisy is that students who graduate from the MSB have a, a better French proficiency than the Francophones in the regions. And, and I've said it so many times in, in the interviews that I had on CJAD, they should reach out to Joe Ortona and ask him what's the formula and apply to there. Because the French is not in danger because of us. It's in danger because the francophones are not getting a proper education in their own regions. So with that, that that was my my second comment. It's ten fifteen. Does anybody want to give a last a last speech before we adjourn for the night? I'll just say, Mark, what you said. That's a good ad campaign if you can pull that off. We we will. It's actually something that I thought of for the party. Very good. Hey, yeah, it was really interesting tonight. There was great dialogue uh, going back and forth. Um, uh, productive in some ways, yes. In some ways, maybe not. But uh, what it might have lacked there it was definitely entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, the goal the goal of the think tank is to have the conversation. It's not to come to a conclusion or anything like that. The conclusion can come with the new party or anything like that. But it's it's you know we're talking amongst ourselves and. I really do want to try to do this again, and yeah. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to push it in the in the francophone community. And I was thinking of having it just in French, like that. I could see if if they would come because a lot of them are interested. A lot of people want to participate. When when yeah. I went to the rally on the 26th, there, 
a lot of francophones were, were interested in having conversations. So, Absolutely. You know what? Getting the two solitudes to meet uh, dis disproves a lot of myths and uh, fallacies and on both sides. And uh, they people start to realize how much they have in common, rather how much they ha they're they're different. And when once you break down those barriers, well, everything's great. Absolutely, and I mean, look at Ontario. You know, francophone Quebecers that are in Ontario are are getting so well with anglophone Ontario. And, and they say that they have, and that's why I'm, I was so inspired by Guy Rex Rogers' movie, What We Choose to Remember, and the prequel, I call it the prequel, but uh, The Rise and Fall of Montreal. English you know? Montreal. The Rise and Fall of English Montreal? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So it, it, was a, it, it, it opened my eyes, and, and it goes to show that language is just a political tool that they're using to divide us. And that's why I think with the new party that we're creating, we're going to offer something that's very different, a different alternative, a different solution, a different prospect. That's, that's all I'm going to say on that. But I think Tony, you had wanted to say something. So yeah. Tony, go ahead. Yeah. My final thought I'd like to leave with you. And this had to do with, what uh, I think you talked about several minutes ago about francophones wanting to speak English in Quebec, young francophones. I know of only two public opinion polls conducted in Quebec over the past 50 years that directly asked francophone Quebecers, not anglophones, francophone Quebecers, whether they wanted to have freedom of choice and language of education for themselves, just as anglophones do. And the first was a poll conducted with Crop and the Gazette. 61 percent, I'm sorry, 61 or 63 percent of Quebecers, Francophone Quebecers said yes. Then Le Devoir, about five or six years later, did the same poll. And a majority again, a smaller majority, but it was about 51 percent. So we all know that when it comes to human rights, Anglophones have the human right of freedom of choice and language of education. Francophones and allophones do not. Although this issue has gone to the Supreme Court and the Francophone parents who wanted the right uh, to have their children educated in English were defeated by a unanimous decision, I would remind you that international law requires it. And Quebec and Canada are in violation of international law. And yeah. uh, uh, it will surprise you when I say this, but the violation and it violates three or four different covenants, international covenants of which Canada is a signatory. But the main violation is racial discrimination. Because if you read section 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and if you read the language of education provisions of Bill 101, the discrimination is based upon dissent. The question is asked who your parents are and do they have a certificate that is handed down. Dissent is an international definition of racial discrimination. So we're in violation of international law. And wow. I would suggest that we start thinking about doing something called civil disobedience. And it would be a unique type of civil disobedience because it will actually, unlike most acts of civil disobedience where you disrupt things and you violate people's rights, our act of civil disobedience will be an expansion of rights. And that is to open up our English schools regardless and in spite of current federal and provincial laws to all that want to come to English schools. That I believe is where our concentration should be. Political parties, we've tried that. It's a long, drawn-out affair, but this is something we can do. There are schools. It wouldn't be easy to do, but it's something we should start thinking about. Well, uh, Tony, if that's really something, uh, I think that's a very interesting thing. If you would like to come back to the think tank and present that, just like Rahul did, you're you're more than welcome to, and, and present to. it. In. Okay. Yeah, I heard awesome. the, I heard about the UN thing too the other day. Nick Chrysanthopoulos, uh, if you see him a lot in the groups, he uh, he's the one that told me about it, you know. So, um, but the problem is, you know, if you want to go to the UN, 
takes money. It, it, going to the UN, which McIntyre did in the early 90s, you know, is a long drawn out affair and they will only accept it once all domestic remedies are exhausted, that is going to the Supreme Court, which we've yeah. done here and we lost. But we could do it either as civil disobedience or just saying it's the law, international law of which Canada is a signatory. By the way, when Canada signs an international covenant, they have to get the permission of the provinces before they do when it impacts provincial jurisdiction. So when Canada signed these covenants, they got Quebec's permission before they did. So we could do it as claiming that it's the law anyways, ha ha ha, and then if people say, no, it's not domestic law, we can always say, well, then it's our act of civil disobedience. And the bottom line is Francophones want it in the majority. Yeah. And when it comes to their kids, I don't know any other issue that will get more support than something. I'm glad. Kids. I'm glad that uh, you said that because we have a concept that we're going to be proposing that's going to that's going to blow the lid off of everything. Very interesting. Anybody else? Last last word, Allah. Good. Oh, I'm Joseph. good. You can't hear me anyway. Thank you for joining us, Tony. Very we hear, we hear. You're well, you're very knowledgeable, I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Set that Mark. Hey my buddy. So I'm before we say good so before we say our goodbyes, I would like to thank Rahul for taking the time to present tonight. For the conversation it was very lively again <laughs> we surpassed the one hour limit uh, is that a new record <laughs> a new Palon de quebec uh, record i i think so i think so two and a half hours yeah. wow two and a half hours almost yeah so thank you very much uh, Rahul. we look oh, forward to, to having you and more thank you Bye. and have a good evening everyone all right thank you, take Norberto. care all right thank you, time for supper here good night, night. Bye. Right. Bye, Norbert. Cheers. Bon, you, Tony. bon appetit, Tony. Thank you. Bye.